it's more on, on the traditional side of the 2D with spin. Um, so uh, on this slide here, it's quite a busy slide. Um, it's essentially for advertisement of what you know, the kinds of things we do and we've been doing over the last couple of years. Um, one of one overriding team uh, theme here is essentially spin orbit interaction uh, in, in semiconductors. Um, so there are things like um, quantum dots, quantum mouse chains, like Majorana chains, for those of you who are interested. Um, also persistent spin helix, also even a skirmion lattice, spin hall effect, weak localization stuff. Um, but I guess what I want to emphasize is that we are able to find in the recent years um, sort of edge states in non-topological materials. So that's mainly the main message that I um, tried to convey to you today. And, and for that, I will be focusing on this work here, which is the work of one of my uh, form, former PhD students, Dennis um, Kanjadu, um, who is now abroad doing a postdoc. And um, later on, I'm going to be here for the next two weeks, so I'd be glad to discuss any of these topics uh, with you. Um, this is actually some recent work um, that involves this persistent spin helix where we are able to show that you can tune this. Um, it's a collaboration with the experimental group of D Dominic Zumbul in Basel where we're able to show that you can tune the alpha, the Rajba interaction um, to equal strength with the, the Dresser house. Uh, but this we do this not only uh, on a single point, but rather on a wide range of densities. So you're varying the density here, and you can still keep this coupling tuned to each other so that you can actually see, or in principle, you can devise a persistent spin helix with variable pitch. So alpha essentially and beta essentially defines the pitch of this helix. Um, more recently, we also studied this uh, topological phenomena in metals. So we have topological insulators um, in this case and also in that case, but also we close the gap and we also find things like the edge states. I'm going to go through this in detail later on. I'm just uh, highlighting a few of the findings. And more recently, we also studied this weak localization. So this is like a sort of one of the dinosaur type of problems where you you know, this theory of weak localization has been uh, around for many years. There is one still m missing, you know, um, point there that we, in collaboration with um, Professor Marinesco, uh, Catalina Marinesco from Clemson, and also Dominic and his former student, uh, we were able to provide a full picture, including also the spin arbor interaction of Rajba and Rasohaus. Um, so these are the <laughs> collaborators. I have um, some students. All these three guys here, João, Marcos, and Ronaldo are here, spending the next two weeks. I also have a couple of the um, uh, undergraduate research students and also another master's student who are not here. And those are the collaborators. Um, mostly for this talk, I'm going to be talking about the work done by Dennis. Michael is also involved in this work. And that's the sort of work that uh, he started, you know, halfway through his PhD, and uh, eventually Michael, do, do, during one of these conferences, you know, chipped in with some nice ideas involving this system that we ended up studying. Um, so um, this kind of initiative, this kind of workshop, is very important as far as you know, getting started on new collaboration. So I, I encourage the students to actually, you know, talk to people and then try to get things going, it's quite important. Um, so here's a roughly, a rough outline of what I'm going to you know, tell you. So I will uh, mention briefly the old motivation for this Spintronics, and then I will um, you know, briefly talk about the so-called BHC model, how the edge states appear there, and mostly the fact that you have edge states and uh, you, know, you need burn inversion and things like that. And then we introduce you to this new bismuth-based topological insulators. And then I'll eventually say the opposite in the second half. Say that you don't really need to have a topological material to actually have edge states. So that's the new thing. And, and uh, that's the main message. 
and I'll flash a few slides on this channel insulators. Uh, so this is an old slide that I used to show in my you know, talks, and it has to do with the spin fat. Um, you know, this is the usual field effect transistor. You know, you essentially it's a source and drain, and you have uh, like current flowing between the source and drain, and can control via this gate the flow of, of charge. Now, back in the 90s, Data and DAS proposed the so-called spin field effect transistor, which is a variant of this, in which the drain and the source are ferromagnetic material. So, you in principle, you can inject spin polarized current, and with the gate, somehow you can imagine you can control this um, the spin of the electron. So the electron goes, you know, doing some kind of um, uh, some of a rotation along the way, and because the the two uh, source and, and drains have the same polarization, it cannot go through. But if you imagine, due to this Rajba effect, um, which is essentially spin orbit interaction, that you can actually gate the system and change somehow the strength of the spin orbit interaction, that's been realized experimentally. And you can imagine the electron doing some kind of a somersault and then being able to it end up on this other side with the, the right polarization so it can go in. So that would be the on of the device. So in principle, this would be less costly in terms of uh, energy. It's easier to rotate the spin and to push away charges from, uh, from a channel. So that actually has been realized, but you know, since a couple of years ago, the, the, the whole shift, you know, the whole um, uh, emphasis or, or direction on in this community that has shifted to topological stuff. So this has been put aside and, uh, and also the money is, is in, uh, in, in some other areas now. So there has been recently some renewed interest in the spin orbit interaction. And in my opinion, it's, it's due to three factors that I'm going to briefly mention here. One is the so-called topological insulators. That was uh, which is essentially a solid, which has some identity <laughs> problem. So it doesn't quite know whether it's a, it's a metal or, a, or, a, or, a, or, a, or an insulator. So superficially, it's a uh, it's uh, it's a metal, and uh, I deep inside it's uh, it's an insulator. So um, essentially, um, it's a two-phase solid. So it has a bulk gap, but on the edges it has this uh, linearly dispersing um, bands, um, and they are protected. So it's gapless. So it's a metal on the surface, um, and because of this uh, spin momentum locking, you cannot really flip once you produce an electron in, a, in a, say, right moving carriers with spin up, it cannot really flip to the other side, which is moving you know, the other way around, unless you break time reverse symmetry. For instance, by having a um, magnetic impurit or you put a magnetic field or something like that. So um, spin orbit is very important in the, in the way we define this band topology, which I'm not going to go into. Topology is not really necessary in this case. In, uh, actually, in, in none of this, you can get away with just case, you know, simple k.p theory to explain everything. But anyway, the spin orbit interaction is right is there, and we've been working on this for some time. A couple of papers here. Uh, this is actually the experimental, the first experimental realization um, in the literature in by the group of Lawrence Mollenkamp, where you can actually see this two e square over eight, which is essentially, which is essentially counting the number of channels that you have, these are helical states. Um, another reason why there was this renewed interest in, in semiconductors um, and, and the spin orbit interaction in semiconductors is my own fermions. Um, so this actually bound states, not the you know, you know, free states that you have in high energy. So those are essentially you know, bound states, and you can show that the, the, uh, the operators that describe these quantities, they are actually um, uh, equal to uh, its antiparticle. So in the language of field theory, if I have a creation operator creates a particle, a destruction operator creates an antiparticle, and they're both equal. So that means that the, the, uh, these operators are actually um, describing particles that are chartless, they have real wave function, not complex wave function like the electrons. And it's important to realize that spin orbit interaction is also very important in that system in, in, that in this context. In fact, there's a break there was a breakthrough some years ago, some s seven years ago, in which people realized that by combining 
conventional materials like S-wave superconductivity in a semiconductor one wire with spin armor interaction, you could actually produce unconventional uh, super superconducting P-wave pairing in a normal, you know, ordinary system. And um, it's known that unconventional P-wave superconductivity hosts can host Majorana fermions. So that was uh, like a breakthrough in the system. We also have, a, you know, have to have the Zeeman effect in order to to open up a little gap and and remain in one of the the uh, the species only, say, spin up, for instance. So the standard system is looks something like that. You have a wire on top of a superconductor, um, and that. Around 2012, there's been this by now very classic paper. Uh, there have been many others in which they've seen this is this essentially measuring the conductance of the system. This is the, the density of state, which is essentially the conductance. So what you see here is, is uh, it should be essentially the density of state of the superconductor. So you have the you know the rise up here, and then it should go all the way down, and then here, and then up again. But of course, it's not like that. But still. You know, it, it's, it's, it's what they call a soft gap. Um, what's new in this system, what is new here is that the prediction from theory is that you would have a uh, Majorana end mode localized right in the gap of the material. That would give rise to a uh, peak, in a zero bias peak in this measurement, in the conductance. So right in the middle of the gap of the superconductor, you should not expect anything. You'd have this, this conductance peak. Uh, this is still very controversial. Well, so it depends on who you talk to, but of course, people who've been measuring this around the world you know, by now believe that this is really a Majorana peak, but um, um, it's still, in my opinion, uh, not clear cut. You know, and maybe you would need to do some more experiments uh, where you would demonstrate braiding to actually be able to say that um, those are actually Majorana parents, because this could be, you know, like condo effect. Disorder. There's so many. There's a wide range of different possibilities that explain this. I anyhow, this is still a very active field of research, and uh, with um, many developments uh, in the recent years. And the third reason um, that we had the spin orbit renewed interest in this is, you know, um, uh, this the possibility of generating uh, artificial or synthetic gauge potentials or gauge fields. And especially in this um, cold atoms in optical lattice uh, community. So in at NIST, people have been doing this kind of thing. So you can, in principle, generate spin orbit interactions, which is a kind of a gauge potential. Um, so let me then briefly introduce what topological insulator is, the ad main idea. So these are like ordinary materials, like the mercury telluride and cadmium telluride. This is a band structure here. So the valence and conduction bands and uh, the what these materials have that is you know that's very distinct is the um the symmetry i mean the ordering of the bands right and this is the usual ordering let's see um va valence band and the conduction band in red here in blue i wanted to focus on the blue and the red ones for instance right um this is like s symmetry because it comes from an os s orbital in a tight binding view if you want the same here most of the valence bands are from B-type states. And in, in mercury telluride, if you imagine an electron going from here, from this material to the other material, what happens is that the, uh, the P states are, you know, appears uh, as the conduction band would be, and, and this is this inversion, if you want. Now, if you can um, imagine some electron going from the conduction band into the other material, it necessarily has to go through a region where the gap closes, and that has to happen right at the interface. So this is like a you know, hand waving, you know, uh, way of um, explaining why you should have a metallic interface between uh, the two materials. Um, so um, this is actually a 3D topological insulator. I'm going to be focusing on what we call a 2D topological insulator later on. Um, so these are essentially. Uh, what happens, you know, they, we're going to end up with metallic states that are time reversal um, protected, time reversal protected, because they are, s you know, single Kramer spares. Um, it's, it's the picture I showed you before. It happens right here at the interface. Um, and uh, you can ask me later about this, but this inversion is due to not only the spin over interaction, but also the mass velocity term. That's something that's misleading a little bit in literature. We don't usually emphasize the inversion is due to just the spin-orbit interaction, it's, it's 
really true uh, that it as the, the mass velocity plays a you know very important role in this. Now, what is this topological insulator? So that's the bulk, uh, a bulk uh, to these systems. So they have a gap there, so an infinite system in all directions. Now imagine you cut the system in a half, and uh, what a topological insulator is 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 is, is uh, a system in which the bulk is an insulator, and the on the edges of on the physical edges of the system, uh, there is actually edge states, and I will show you in, uh, in a with a concrete example later on that this is the solution of the Schrodinger equation that you just find is like that. So you have the bulk bands separated by a gap, but right at the interface you have linearly dispersing modes that are metallic because it's gapless. Now, this in, in principle happens at the interface and more importantly, they have this so-called spin momentum locking. So, for instance, this red curve here, it describes an electron, say, with spin down and it's non-degenerate and the other one that's moving the other way because the, the derivative of this curve is essentially the group velocity, it describes an electron, say, with spin up moving the other way, just like here. So they lie on top of each other in real space. They have different spins, but they cannot scatter from one another, from one to the other one, because it's topological in the sense that um, the topology here, I mean, I was going to briefly introduce, just in the sense that you can produce some kind of changes in the Hamiltonian, say due to some defects or imperfection along this uh, direction here of the interface, and the states will not be destroyed. I mean, you can change, you know, the uh, the gap a little bit, but, you know, the states are going to be there. You cannot get rid of those states. In fact, you can calculate topological invariance, you know, so those are like uh, indices that are uh, discrete and you cannot really, unless you close the gap, these states won't go away. Now, if you have a uh, another way to, to look at how this uh, robustness happens is that if you have a defect, and an electron is moving, you know, down that way, uh, we we'll say spin up. Once it sees an electron in, in defect, you can actually show that the matrix element, as long as this V here is time reversal uh, symmetric, you're not breaking any time reversal symmetry. You can show that this is actually zero, so you cannot scatter from, say, going moving forward to moving backwards. So what happens is that the electron essentially turns around and goes away. So uh, it been in, in and just proceeds with its um, trajectory. Um, and that's why this kind of um, transport would be dissipationless. That's the, the hype about this. This is strictly speaking valid only in 2D because we're talking about protection against backscattering. So I'm moving down this way, the spin up, and I want to flip my spin and go back this way. I can't. But this is for backscattering. If I, I, this is what, what you know, I'm emphasizing here, it's a 2D topological insulator. So you have a 3D topological insulator, this uh, protection is not as great because you have actually a Dirac cone, it's 3D, you're on the surface, and you can actually uh, scatter um, uh, via a small angle scatter, so um, scattering. So that's not really um, fantastic as, as, as opposed to this case here. Now, as I mentioned before, you can go on and read you know, some of these papers. Um, um, you can construct, you can um, fabricate a sample for um, cadmium telluride, mercury telluride, quantum mile, and uh, in different regimes you find that the system can show this topological insulator behavior, and this 2 square rate is essentially counting the number of, um, of channels that you have, you know, this edge state uh, channels. There's a model that describes this. This is the so-called Bernevig um, Hughes um, Zhang uh, model, and that was the first topological insulator that there was, um, or that was proposed. So that's cadmium telluride, mercury telluride here, and, and cadmium telluride again. It's a quantum mile, but it's a type. It's what they call a type three quantum mile, in which the uh, the top of the bottom of the conduction electrons here of the, of the well potential overlaps with the top of the of the of the uh, valence electrons. Um, usually if you have things like gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide, this uh, the top and the bottom of you know this blue and, and red curves that are far apart. So you can never have 
an inversion of this H1 and E1 level here. So that's actually happens only in this kind of material because of this inversion I showed you before in bulk. So there's actually a second inversion here. Bulk is already inverted, and then uh, when I make when I fabricate a quantum well, I can also tune the system. I actually tune the width of the well. So we all know that if you have a quantum well, if you increase the width of the well, the levels will go closer down to the bottom of the well, right? And the same happens for the whole state. So eventually they cross. And this crossing is important to produce what we want. It's, it's possible to, um, within a k.p theory, to come up um, with a model that describes this physics, and that's what I'm going to be uh, doing next. And if you want details, we can talk about it. So the minimum model, minimum model that uh, describes these four states that I just showed you is the so-called BHC model. And it's an acronym with just the names of the proponents there. So this essentially <laughs> describes one electron spin up or down in the conduction band, one hole, in fact, it's a heavy hole coupled to, uh, to the electrons, um, up and down in the valence band as well. So that's why you have a four by four uh, model. Um, it's so this describes the state I just showed you. Uh, in principle, you can, those are blocks that are essentially Kramer spares. The system is uh, time averse or symmetric. And you can easily solve this Hamiltonian in bulk. So that's a 2D Hamiltonian describing electrons and valence electrons in a 2D plane. So this is the exact solution. You essentially have the two bands like this. And there's an important um, primer here, which is this so-called mass gap, or simply gap, which is the distance or the difference between the, the uh, lowest energy of the electron and the energy of the hole in the quantum L. That primer, uh, this primer here can actually be tuned by varying the well width, so it can actually become negative. And with that, I can, uh, I will show you next, you can invert those two bands, right? So these are all very simple. Um, that's what I mentioned uh, before. I take just one block here, I can solve for this, and I, I define a topological system uh, to be a system where this mass gap is positive. So this would be this side here. And if I change the parameters of the my system, say the, the width of the well, I get a negative mass gap like this. And I can, of course, the same way I did before, I can track the symmetries of the wave function. So I know there is a band inversion here. That's pretty much like what I showed you in 3D. But that's now in the geometry where I have a quantum well. Right? Now, I we studied this many years ago. <laughs> Let's just focus to give a concrete example for in this case here, where I have, um, now I make an interface. Everything I showed so far here, it's just bulk, an infinite system, right? So I claim, right, that, you know, if the system, if I make an interface between these two systems, just like before, the gap will have to close at some point, because I'm going from here to there, and then, you know, the, the gap is inverting. So somehow, the interface between these two materials has to be gapless. So let's take an interface like this, where um, I will call a topological insulator something that has a negative mass gap, and uh, a normal insulator, something that has a positive gap. For instance, this would be a normal insulator, and this is a 2D topological insulator. So that's, that's my definition. Uh, and I will show you that um, there will be edge states at the interface, right? So I have a system like that, and the Hamiltonian is essentially the Hamiltonian I had before. But now, because I have along the y direction, I have an interface, my ky is not a good quantum number anymore, so I have to change the usual, you know, make the usual change like this. And I have to solve this, right? Just an ordinary, you know, um, Schrodinger equation, like for this system. And I just use the ends at like this, and I impose, you know, the you know, condition that the wave function has to be continuous, and also it's derivative. And this is an ansatz where you may be tempted to think that ky here is just unfortunate that I use the same ky. Ky here is just a number. could be a complex. And it's not the same as this ky. So I'm not taking the derivative there either. This is, uh, I should change this. this is, uh, notice every time I give this talk, eventually I, I say I, I kept it because if, it, if this system here were not topological, I would still have 
plane waves in the system, right? So this is just a number that could be anything, could be a complex number. So I plug this in here um, and in the solution, a psi equals e psi, the usual way you solve for integrations. And you, you can uh, actually find quite nicely, if you consider the, the case where this normal insulator has a mass, m prime, which is much, much bigger than m, which is the negative mass, um, then you can actually find this uh, two dispersing, uh, linearly dispersing uh, curves here that are described by this equation here. And one of them has spin up because um, I didn't tell you that, but if you go back here and, uh, and look at this BHC model, when you're deriving this BHC model, uh, you see clearly that this upper block refers to what they call spin up, and the lower block is spin down, real spin down. 90.9% .9 is spin down because there's some coupling with you know light holes that change this a little bit, but this is mostly spin down, real spin down, not pseudo spin. Now, here then, when I consider one of the blocks to do this calculation, I'm dealing with, say, spin up. So each block gives me a dispersion. So that's what I'm showing you here. Say the upper block gives me the plus sign, which is this curve here. And uh, pictorically, it means an electron moving up this way will spin up. The other block gives me the other dispersion with the minus sign here. So this is this curve here. And it's the, it, it, at the interface, it means that you have side by side, like lanes with spin up going this way, spin down going the other way. Now, I can also change the mass and vary this mass, make it smaller, and uh, it just shifts the mass, you know, the shift to the, this sort of Dirac point here. But the main physics, physics is the same, right? You have edge states. So those are the edge states. How do I know they are edge states? Because I can plot the wave function. So if I plot the wave function, and it's shown here along the y direction, you can see that it's concentrated near the edge. So the, the, you know, the physical edge is at y equals 0. And then I, I can see for various uh, values of the mass right, that the wave function is localized near the edge. So that's the, um, that's the idea. Now, here's a checklist if you want to go um, and find and look for your own 2D topological insulators. Yeah. The, the blue curve, what is it, the previous one? Yeah, sorry, sorry. The one where the, that's where the, m no, no, the next one. Yeah. The blue one is the case where the masses are equal? Is it Similar. Oh, okay. Yeah, so then that's actually a an, an, an nice um, um, question to, for you to appreciate that in principle if I plot just this, you should you can ask yourself where is actually the edge? Does the edge state belong to this side of the interface or to the other side of the interface? So that's why if you vary it, uh, one way to view it without calculating you know topological invariance is exactly that. So uh, it's actually located. So the black curve is the one, yeah, that's fully concentrated on just the topological insulator. So the other side you can think it's a vacuum, which uh, with a, a extremely high mass cap so the electrons cannot go there. So the electrons are localized in this case on the topological insulating side. Um, another way to find out this is if you calculate the topological invariance and you know uh, which one um, which one it is. Uh, so if you want to go around and um, try to find your own topological insulator, 2D topological insulator, what you, you have to look for, and we did this a couple of times for I'll show you some, some of these uh, results next, is that uh, you have to look for a system um, which is a bulk insulator, and then you have to have somehow in the system a knob, a parameter that you tune so that the gap closes. In the system I just showed you, it's the width of the well. That, you know, as you increase the width of the well, E1 and E2, in, in H1 gets closer together, they touch, and then eventually they get inverted. And of course, because you have some residual interaction, there is still K dot P kind of interaction, the gap opens up again. So a topological insulator is an insulator, which is an insulator before the gap closes and after the gap closes. So we have a gap here as well. So it's an insulator before and after. 
And in between, right where it crosses, it could be along across an interface, there will be some gapless states. Um, and of course, when I say it has to be an insulator before and after, it has to be an insulator across the Brillouin zone. It's not just a particular point of the Brillouin zone, because that's not an insulator. You know, if it's, it has a gap, it's some what appears to be a gap, it's say a gamma point, and then you go to the X point or some other point of the Brillouin zone, and and uh, and and the gap is not there, then it's not an insulator. An insulator is something that has an overall gap, and that's also it's like kind of tricky to find things like this. So. Um, then, of course, you can go on. I'm not going to go through this here. Calculate some kind of topological invariant, like some, uh, something similar to a churn number. In this case, it's actually a churn number for topological insulators is actually zero, but the difference of churn numbers for up and down spins is non-zero, which is related to the spin hole conductivity. And then there's something very important, which is the so-called bulk edge correspondence. So if a system in bulk is what we call a topological insulator, that means that if you cut the system in a half and look at, at the interface or at the edges of the sample, the physical edges, you find quantum states that live there. That's that those are the states I just showed you. I calculated. So if you just take a normal material like gallium arsenide or anything that's not topological in the sense I'm showing you here, and you look at the interface or you look at the, the surface of the material, you may find defects, you may even find localized states there, but those are not topological states. I mean, if you clean enough the sample, or if you apply a gate, or a, you may be able to get rid of those states there. Now, those states that I'm talking about here that live uh, within the gap, you cannot remove them without destroying the material. So that's why people you show, you know, in some, you know, in some um, talks, they will show a donut and a sphere because they differ because of this genus number. And uh, it's the same kind of, you can do the same kind of formulation here. And a topological invariant would be like a donut. You cannot, you know, make a donut, um, turn a donut into a sphere without actually destroying the donut and vice versa, right? Now, so the bulk edge correspondence is something very important. And it's important also for what I'm going to you know, show you next in the next couple of slides. Because it says that if a system is topological in its bulk form, somehow when you cut the system in a half or make it finite, there will be edge states. That's the message between you know of this um, bulk edge correspondence here. It turns out that the systems are helical, and uh, helical states just what I showed you. A helical state is a state that uh, is 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 uh, it's moving. It's a pair of states in which one is moving up down this way, say if we spin up, and the other is going down that way if we spin down. This is a pair like that is a helical state, as opposed to what people call a chiral state, like in an integer quantum Hall effect, in which two edge states are moving down the same way we spin with opposite spins like this. So in the usual integer quantum Hall effect, you have chiral state. They both circulate around the sample. Th a helical state are opposite moving <laughs> states. Now, in, uh, in a quantum dot, which I'm going to consider in a bit, I'm going to show you that we are able to find edge states even without uh, being in a, in a topological phase. And that's going to be the main message. So in a way, we're sort of violating or finding a counterexample of this uh, bulk edge correspondence here. So this is actually the first part of this paper here in which we propose a new um, um, topological insulator, 2D topological insulator. So this is the usual, you know, um, this is the canonical topological insulator. The first experiment was, was performed in this kind of sample where you uh, have macro telluride sandwiched between uh, two layers of cadmium and telluride. It's quite a nice system. The only problem is that a few people, a few groups in the world can actually grow this sample and, and, and make and do measurements on those. And as one, as one of them is Mollenkamp's group. The other one is Again, I had group, but you know, my colleague at the University of Sao Paulo gets sample from somewhere in, in the Um Well, what we, we would like to do, it would be desirable, and people have been trying to do this, uh, is to actually try to get a topological insulator out of ordinary 3-5 materials, like gallium arsenide, indium, um, antimonide, and things like that. So those are 2-6 materials. They're trickier, less conventional than the usual 3-5 materials. Um, so, some years ago, with my colleague, um, um, Sigurd Ellison, we 
proposed um, in our electrotopological insulator. It's actually a very nice paper. I really like this one um, because we only have uh, electrons. So usually here you have electrons and holes. And almost most of the proposals, I guess 100% except this one, involve electrons and holes to propose a topological insulator. So if you want to mo learn more about this, you know, like I'm glad to discuss this with you. Um, it involves this spin orbit interaction in double wells. So uh, we can come up with a nice way to do it. Now, for this uh, paper, which is I'm going to um, discuss next, we it's essentially the same kind of proposal. But it, you know, the novelty here is that you include bismuth. And when you put bismuth in this indium antimonide, bismuth has a level, uh, a localized level, right in the middle of the valence band. So to give you a very simple uh, explanation why it turns out to be uh, interesting is that because of anti-crossing of this level, you essentially decrease the gap. And when you decrease the gap, you enhance all these features that come from the spin orbit interaction. Now, you may have seen these in talks uh, involving mercutelluride. So that's uh, usually the E1 and H1 levels, the heavy hole and the electron levels. And as you increase D, it crosses eventually, so that means that there is an um, inversion that is very similar to mercury telluride. It's actually identical. The only advantage here is that we have um, bigger gaps, big inversion gaps. So that's almost like room temperature, right? But uh, except from that, it's the same. Um, and also, this technical issues, especially if you're a crystal grower, you this is actually important. The bismuth is not really uh, moving around too much on the surface. So this is the first part of this paper where we propose a new topological insulator with bismuth, not very exciting. But then uh, what we did later uh, was to, um, so this is the, the, uh, the proposal, right? We can calculate all these parameters. We can um, define a, uh, actually it's quite complete. We also have spin orbit interactions and, uh, that are not in the original BHC model. Um, but it's very similar, right? So what, what did you do with this after we proposed that? Well, the second part of the paper is uh, where we say, okay, let's, let's you know, that's, that's Dennis, the first author here, uh, um, playing with uh, the system and decided to actually confine and look into a confined geometry, like a quantum dot, cylindrical quantum dot. So um, it turns out that uh, he was able to find what we did, you know, called uh, geometrically protected edge states in dots that are not topological. So what I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides um, is essentially a set of uh, um, numerical results that in which I'm contrasting uh, a quantum dot made in a regime uh, where the system is initially topological, and then in another set with the dot which is in a regime where the original system is not topological. So in one case, you would have edge states. In the other case, you would not or you should not have edge states. And to give you already the punch, the punch line is that we essentially find that in both cases, uh, we find edge states, protected edge states. And that was some, uh, it's unusual to some extent, and it's in, in, in contrast um, to the bulk edge correspondence. I, as I showed you. Of course, if the dot is non-topological, there's no topological index. There's no topological invariant as opposed to the topological dot, which would justify the bulk edge correspondence. Um, so um, so how do we do this? Uh, well, we essentially take the BHC model, which we calculated all the parameters, and we add a, confine a cylindrical confinement, just like this, very simple. And of course, for this you know, Casey, we're showing this the uh, infinite well kind of confinement, this so I can show you some expressions. But in the paper, we do it also for finite um, um, confinement. So we essentially have something like this, right? We confine it. And for simplicity, I would just neglect all these other terms like the spin orbit interaction, this uh, Rajba type, alpha and beta are all zero here. So we end up with just this, the usual BHC, but for bismuth. Right, and um, it's possible to show that this because the system has cylindrical symmetry, the wave function are a function of r and theta, right? And J z is the total angular momentum. That is the, um, the, the good quantum number there. 
and just like what we do in the usual quantum mechanics, uh, we can apply the boundary conditions, and we find, you know, we, you know, we take this as a, as a, as a two by two, uh, a two by one uh, spinner, right? It's complicated, looks uh, complicated because you have all these Bessel functions, um, uh, because the system has cylindrical symmetry, but it's actually quite simple to do the algebra, and uh, when you impose, it, you know, the conditions of the continuity of the wave function, uh, and you end up with transcendental equations, just like what you do in quantum mechanics. In square well, you impose the condition, you get a transcendental equation. You can easily solve this in mathematic or maple, right? And this is uh, the total angular momentum. So that includes electrons that has um, um, orbital angle angular momentum zero, and also the holes that has that have an angular momentum one. That that's why you end up with things like three halves and so on. So um, we can calculate what we call circulating currents. That's the usual quantum mechanical object that we, you know, we give you a wave function. You can always calculate the current. Of course, it's a cylindrical geometry. I'll have a current circulating like this, another circulating like that. This also, um, it's all proportional to this, you know, funny um, uh, 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 wave functions here, part of the wave function, right? So this also appear here, right? It's all part of the the wave function is not, uh, it's always straightforward, it's a bit messy. So you can actually calculate this, plot them, and we can plot them in, uh, say, the topological regime. Remember, I have this usual picture where I have E1 and H1, and I can be either on this side or on this side of the crossing. So I can be on the topological and the non-topological regime. So I will start showing results for the topological regime. So for the topological regime in the 2D, just as a reminder, right? You have the edge states and they are linearly dispersing um, like that. And if I have a dot, you get this. This is the dispersion. Everything is discrete now, right? This is to be contrasted with that, right? So I have K here and I have the two massless or gapless states. And now I have JZ here and I have states that are, you know, lying in the where the gap was. But now everything is discrete. So the gray area here is where the gap uh, was previously, like here, right? So that's essentially a discrete version of the other case. Not nothing really is surprising. Of course, then this edge state they enter in the region where you used to have the bulk states. Of course, now everything is discrete. So if the states, if you take an energy right here, this electron cannot flip onto this one. It's also protected, right? Here we call it spin angular momentum locking because you have electrons going around like this and the other electron will spin up is going around like that. So they cannot flip on each other. The same thing, there's nothing really unusual there. Um, so we can also look at the wave functions for all those states. You can see that they're like you know, located near the edges of the sample. This, remember, this is a center. That's the radius of the, of this, um, of the dot here, right? So those states here are mostly localized near the edges. They're circulating this way or the other way. Uh, you can go on and calculate the currents, right? You can show that they obey this kind of uh, relationship. So one is the other way. So up is, say, electron going this way, minus is that way, and the one is minus the other, right? So um, you can plot the density as, you know, cross-section of this. So this is the cross-section of the dot for say these two states here. They you can look at what the J, Z, are. everything is so, it's very simple actually. You can see the current is indeed localized near the edges for the topological regime, right? Um, and they are also time reversal protected as I mentioned, because essentially because these are single Kramer's pairs. That's important to say, I mean, right here, um, these states are non-degenerate. I cannot go from here to there unless you break time reverse symmetry. So uh, once you have single Kramer pairs, you, you there, you know, they cannot flip into one another. Now, let's look at um, at the top non-topological case. So I w the result I just showed you is for a topological two-dimensional system uh, from which I actually make a quantum dot. So then I get these edge states in the dot. Right. So now I'm going to change the sizes of the dots, so I'm changing the size of the dots. So I go from there to here where the gap closes, and then I open up the gap again. So 
I go back to the non-topological regime now. So the results I'm going to show you next is for this case here. So this the dot is non-topological. So what happens is exactly this. Look, now I start like this, then I increase the size of the um, of the confinement along the z-direction that generated my two-dimensional acting system. Eventually, u1 touches you know h1, and if I decrease the confinement along the z-direction further, uh, it goes back to the uh, the trivial two-dimensional acting system, right? So you can see from this figure that you're essentially pushing this edge states towards the valence bands. And there's nothing in, in, in the gap anymore. So that's the result of squeezing further. Not the dot. I'm not touching the dot yet. I'm squeezing the two-dimensional acting system that generated, that I used as a template to generate the, uh, the quantum dot. So those are the edge states. Uh, I don't know whether they are the state. They used to be edge states here, but now there I don't know. I have to look at the wave functions, right? And that's what we do now. So I'm going to um, um, look at this, this um, thing here. Um, here I had single Cromer spares, right? In this state here where it's uh, inverted, the single Cromer spares, even if they are edge states, you know, they are degenerated this bunch of electrons, a bunch of states that are down here, which I'm calling them bulk states. I'm anticipating that those are more like delocalized states. So I have to manage if I want to be able to look at edge states and say that they are protected, I should be able to somehow separate these states from these uh, so-called edge states. And uh, an interesting thing that Dennis, Dennis found was that uh, edge states and bulk states, they have a different, uh, a different sensitivity to the sizes of the dot. So remember, edge states live near the edge. So if I change the radius of the dot, so now I'm, I'm going to be changing the radius of the dot. I'm not going to be confining this way anymore, just the size of the dot. So if I change the size of the dot, what happens is that they move. You know, the, the dot became smaller by amount delta, right? And the level of the dot, pictorially shown here, changes a little bit. Now, if I'm looking at the bulk state, what, uh, what Dennis found is that if you change by the same delta, there's a huge shift of the bulk discrete states. And that allowed us to um, play with this, um, the radius of the dot, but not, not fine-tuning. This is what I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides. It's not fine-tuning. Right? There's a range of radii for which this is perfectly fine. So it's not just like one particular point that everything, no, it's a range of variables. In this case, the radii, the, the radius of the dot, for which that if I make, say, the dot smaller, I will be able to push these levels down while I was still keeping these states here, you know, more or less where they were. So I am able, we're able to, you know, come up with, this, say, if with R equals 30, and actually between, you know, 0 and 30 or something, depending on the parameters, it can be even higher. You, you can get this kind of configuration here where I, where I have a gray area in which I have single Cromer spares. You know, for the students, single uh, Cromer spare is a solution of a Schrodinger equation that has spin, so it cannot be just a uh, spinless particle. Uh, and, and you show that if it's the wave function, one sol you have a solution that called psi, then the time reversal operator acting on the psi is also another solution, and they are degenerate in energy. That's a Cromer spare. So they're orthogonal. You cannot scatter one into the another. So those are the spares here, right? So protection is not something that is assured by a topological insulator, by a, by a topological invariant. Protection here and also in the topological case, it's, it's essentially because you have a single Cromer's pair at a given energy. So if I'm sitting here, I cannot go from here to there. I don't need to have a topological invariant to say that the, the system is protected. It's because of, um, time of, uh, because of, uh, of b having a single Cromer spare. So I can also plot the wave functions. They are helical. 
by the same reason, I can do essentially the same plot. If you, you, you know, in the next couple of slides, you're going to have, you can have the impression you're like seeing the same pictures. And it is true, it's, it's similar, but it's not the same picture. Look at, you know, you, you please realize that this is not really in the gap. So that's a big difference. It's not in the gap. Somewhere in the valence band, but it's still, it, everything looks like it's localized, and it is indeed localized. You can make a plot. And, uh, and in fact, if you compare numerically all these numbers, you can see that the peaks of these currents, it's actually bigger than in the, in the case of the topological insulator. Now, in principle, then I also have protection against an elastic backscattering, just like in a topological insulator, even though I don't have a topological uh, invariant here. So we call it geometrically protected helical edge states. And here, side by side, <laughs> you, can, um, you can see that, um, you know, compare them. They have sort of the same features, right, um, you know, within this gray area. The difference still is that this happens within the gap, and this is not within the gap. Now, but you can still ask, is there still something that I could try to calculate to differentiate those two systems, this, those two systems? Well, we went on and we um, did some um, further calculation for the conductance, singling out, say, four states. Um, then we now think of coupling our dots to two leads, right? And then we use non-equilibrium uh, green function, even though we're doing green response with just two green function. Uh, and we calculate the conductance for these uh, four states. Um, and then we can uh, vary the conductance by, uh, by varying the, the configuration of the system by applying a gate and moving these levels up and down, right? Um, so this is the kind of uh, expression. I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but this is pretty standard. And there's nothing new here at all. It's just that the system is. Um, and then what we do is this, right? We take a configuration where we apply a gate and we move this up and down, say changing the gates, I can move this uh, two levels up and down. So and um, in principle, I will plot next, um, I will show you what happens to the conductance. And I can also change the dot radius. So what when I change the dot radius, what I do is I essentially split the levels further because of confinement. So I can go from a you know, R smaller than some R0, then some R0, and then for R bigger than R0, the levels are closer together, so the conductance will change. So um, next, I'm going to just show you this, the results, right? So this picture here corresponds, say, to these four states here. So I'm, do I'm doing first the topological case. So the topological case, I'm singling out four states, which are represented here with all you know the spin, quantum numbers, J's, and everything, and the model is something like a uh, Hubbard type model. You know, we don't have uh, like more like an Anderson type um, without the Hubbard U term. So we have all these possibilities, and and then we we plot the conductance, and then on this gray scale here, um, you have uh, here the quantum dot radius, and here we have the gate, which can essentially change the levels like that or the levels can be split apart by just changing the radius of the dot. So what is shown here is essentially for a given cut, you see two peaks, right? So the, these, uh, this ha the darker colors here goes up to two e squared over h, essentially because you can have, you have two levels at a given energy. So you have two e squared over h, right? And then we can make um, cuts like this, and that's you know, easier to see. You see one peak and then it goes to zero there, and then I can make another cut there, in another cut, I always see this dip, and the dip has to do, uh, if you ask me later, I can show you, it's just uh, the interference, because I have two channels. If when it's right in between, the electron can go this way or that way, like here. The electrons, uh, if I, yeah. It can go like this or like that, if they say the level is right through the middle here. Essentially, they have th there has should be some slightly overlap between this Gaussian there. Then you can get this interference. That's well known in the literature, by the way, this interference. Um, and then we do the same thing for these four levels here for the trivial dot. Same stuff, exactly the same thing. And you get, no surprise, something that is very similar. I can uh, make these uh, cuts as I showed you before. That's for the trivial one. See, same story. Goes up to two. So 
even though there's no, the edge states um, here are, are non-trivial, the, the, the ones here are, are non-trivial, the ones here are trivial, but it's the same physics. So if you have a black box with a dot in and you plug in, you, you, you attach them to leads and you measure conductance, you won't be able to say whether it's topological, which one is topological. They both, are, they both look like they have edge state. They both like look like they are topological. So that was unusual. Okay, so um, in this sense, we have a pun in our title which say that we blur the boundaries, right, um, between topological and non-topological phenomena because they all have this, uh, both of them have this, right? You know, they have edge state, they're protected, and the, the, the circulating currents are, are similar, the conductance the same within linear response, um, and uh, so it's the same thing, right? So this is all in contrast to 2D topological insulators, right? When you when, when people talk about a two-dimensional topological insulator, if the system is trivial, there are no edge states. And if the system is non-trivial or topological, you have edge states right at the boundaries, right? Here, it's not like that. So in lower dimension, it's not like that. Now, I'm um, just going to emphasize once more um, the difference between what we call topological and non-topological, or, he or here trivial quantum dots, as compared to, say, an ordinary quantum dot. So imagine an ordinary gallium arsenide quantum dot or indium arsenide quantum dot. Um, so here are you know, the electronic structure calculated just like I showed you before, here and there. And this is for the non-BHC model. What, what is essential to get this uh, structure? to get this edge states, is, uh, is actually the structure of the BHC Hamiltonian. So a non-BHC dot is essentially a, a gallium arsenide quantum dot. You have like parabolic bands and you confine it. So there's no off-diagonal terms because it's not described by a BHC model. So you can see that when you do this uh, co confinement in a, in a cylindrical dot, down here you have a mass. Not mass, you have a mass, right? It's just the levels are all degenerate. There's no such a thing like here in which you can identify edge states. In addition, you can actually look at the wave function. These are not edge states wave functions. These are like particle in a box wave functions. They're like bulk wave functions. They have a bump there, and they're like sinusoidal here. And uh, those and those are much more similar because they are sort of related I, uh, because they come from the same underlying Hamiltonian, which is the BHC, the you know, Hamiltonian. In the um, supplementary, long supplementary material we have in this paper here, we describe actually how you can you can actually analytically in some asymptotic regime look at the wave functions and see them analytically that they really look like edge state wave functions. So it's actually quite quite nice there. Now um, to um to end my talk, I'm just going to flash a couple of slides. Um, we can talk about um, this you know, along the week if you want. This is to emphasize this uh, work also um, with Dennis. Evelina will be here next week. Uh, she's in Woodsburg. And this is essentially the work I mentioned previously where you have a, a semi-metal uh, or a, a churn insulator. And the essential idea here is that what we call chirosymmetry is something that is more important than band topology, or at least you need it. Um, you could use band topology, meaning that you you would have uh, you can calculate it a, a topological invariant when you have a gap. But to explain, for instance, you know the existence of an edge state way into the bulk metallic you know part of the spectrum, you need something else. And, and that's what this paper is about. It's also related to our the work I just showed you, because in our system we can also talk about this, uh, uh, extending this uh, concept to our well, um, in some sense that uh, the chiral symmetry would be important there as well. Uh, this is the work, um, uh, actually the previous speaker would talk about, and we should talk about this uh, tomorrow, and it has to do with uh, the Zitter Bewegung in, uh, in um, two-dimensional topological insulators. Gerson is also here, is giving a talk tomorrow. So I'm not going to you know, go into that. So um, to summarize, you know, 
what we found is, what we have in our paper is essentially two things. One is this proposal of a new topological insulator. So uh, that would be more, um, uh, I guess, attractive because it involves three, five materials as opposed to two, uh, six materials. It has a larger gap, room temperature. And, and then from these, we um, devised quantum dots, which, as I, I just tried to describe to you, sort of they violate to some extent this bulk edge correspondence uh, by showing edge states without being uh, topological, right? Um, so um, with that, I'll just leave you with this busy uh, slide again to highlight the kind of things we've been doing. Um, Again, the Majorana stuff, the persistent spin helix. If you are interested, we can certainly discuss this. The skirmion lattice. That's actually a very interesting result that we have. One of these sp speakers, um, th which is uh, Poliana, who is here this week. She's also in this paper. Um, and, and the nice thing about this paper is that we are able to produce skirmions. Um, in a non-interacting system. So for those of you who have some knowledge of skimmerions, you, you know that usually they happen in an interacting system, like chiromagnets and, and things like that. So this is quite an interesting system in which you can, um, together with the one I just showed you here, it's an interesting system in which you can look for topological phenomena in ordinary non-interacting system. So with that, I... Um, also advertise this more in this, uh, this recent work. If you have interest in, in uh, weak localization, we can chat about that. And with that, I'll just put my um, conclusion again. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Hi, uh, eggs. Now that you're talking about quantum dots and you have both D and R as the geometrical 